So let's begin. A month after becoming president, Abraham Lincoln had to begin leading a broken nation through the terrible new challenge of civil war. Between 1861 and 1865, he repeatedly suspended the writ of habeas corpus, which authorized declarations of martial law, indefinite detentions, and the formation of military tribunals to try suspected terrorists. He also issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which eventually led to the largest single expansion of freedom and civil liberties in this nation's history. Confronted with the potential destruction of the Union, Lincoln challenged and redefined Americans' understanding of the Constitution, which had created that Union. How might his actions inform the way we think about the Constitution and our civil liberties in today's troubled times? Dr. Mark Neely will help us begin examining this question. He is the McCabe Greer Professor of the American Civil War Era in the Department of History and at the George and Ann Richards Civil War Era Center at Pennsylvania State University. Neely is the author or co-author of 14 books on Abraham Lincoln and the American Civil War, including the recent Lincoln and the Triumph of the Nation, Constitutional Conflict in the American Civil War, and The Fate of Liberty, Abraham Lincoln and Civil Liberties, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. He served 20 years as director of the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Neely is also a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Please welcome him to the forum. Thank you. Thank you. We talk about the Constitution a lot, as I do. Uh, one of the um, problems you have as a speaker is that it's a pretty serious subject, and it's hard to find any jokes about it. But um, <laughs> I did not know about the Minnesota Constitution, and that's going to be my joke in the future. <laughs> so this has been a really great trip. <laughs> oh, I write about Abraham Lincoln, um, but the real hero of my books is the United States Constitution. And one of the reasons for that is that in the Lincoln field, uh, the standard work uh, on the Constitution and Abraham Lincoln is uh, it's a wonderful book by James G. Randall uh, called Constitutional Problems Under Lincoln. It was published in 1926, and yet it still is an uh, indispensable uh, work that you uh, have to use. Uh, but it has left us with one unfortunate legacy, and that's because of its title, Constitutional Problems Under Lincoln. Uh, it has left us with the idea that in the Civil War, the United States Constitution was a problem. Well, it wasn't, or at least not in my view. On the whole, it was an asset uh, to the Lincoln administration. Uh, it, it helped, it shaped the Civil War. Uh, it helped the Union war effort, and I'd argue that it accounts in very substantial part for the Union victory in the Civil War. And let me explain briefly how. I think it's very important, I, I want to make this point initially, uh, that I think the Constitution was essentially an asset uh, before we talk about some of the problems under the Constitution. <clears throat> so how did it shape the Civil War? It's very simple. In the article dealing with the executive, the second article, of course, the President of the United States is given in Article 2, Section 1, is uh, given a four-year term. Uh, and then in Article 2, Section 2, is made the Commander-in-Chief. And in some ways, that's the story of the Civil War. Because uh, that meant, since the Civil War began, is coincident with a presidential term, almost exactly, that meant that for four long years, there was going to be a determined um, anti-slavery Republican uh, who would uh, fight the uh, Confederacy until uh, he was no longer president. Uh, nothing short of impeachment or assassination was going to stop Abraham Lincoln from uh, fighting the war with all of the resources that he could muster. Well, impeachment was out of the question because the Republicans controlled Congress. Uh, and, of course, the assassins didn't get to Lincoln until after four years. So the certainty of his four-year term uh, meant 
uh, that Abraham Lincoln, as commander in chief, really did not have to worry that much about public opinion and certainly didn't have to worry about it in the short run when there was a temporary setback on the battlefield. And that was very important because the Union suffered many temporary setbacks. And so to appreciate the significance, just think of what the United States uh, it, it, during the Civil War would have been like if we'd had, instead of the Constitution, a parliamentary form of government. If we'd had a parliamentary form of government, the Lincoln administration would have been in office for five months, not four years, because of the astonishing defeat of the Union Army at the Battle of Bull Run in July 1861. We have trouble thinking about what a national trauma the uh, defeat at Bull Run induced in the North because, you know, it, it was quickly uh, made to seem like a small uh, a military event by the much greater battles of the Civil War. But when it occurred, it didn't seem like a small event. Uh, in fact, it was shocking. Uh, it was, the shock was extremely vivid, and the whole world uh, knew about it. Um, the armies, the Union armies, fled the battlefield in pell-mell, uh, uh, defeat. Uh, they were led by their officers. The only people trying to restrain the defeat were journalists and politicians who'd gone out to watch uh, the battle. Um, and the, one of the worst things in terms of inducing national trauma uh, was that it was a world spectacle of humiliation. It so happened that the man who invented uh, the um, occupation of war correspondent, the world's first war correspondent, was there on the scene. His name was William Howard Russell. He worked for the London Times. He had covered the Indian Mutiny. Uh, he had covered the Crimea. And he came to the United States to cover the Civil War. He was in Washington at the time of the Battle of Bull Run, but he got up late on the day of the battle. Uh, and when he, went to, when he went to rent a horse, well, all the other people in Washington who'd gone out to see the spectacle had already rented all the horses. Um, and he had trouble getting transportation to the field. And when he finally uh, got to the field, well, it, all he saw was the defeat. All he saw was the Union armies running toward him. Uh, and so uh, that Im humiliating impression of defeat is what he communicated to the world. And it was... Uh, indeed, uh, hum humiliating the uh, armies uh, uh, retreated essentially all, all the way to Washington. Uh, they arrived in a, 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 a torrential downpour, so the soldiers were soaked and forlorn and humiliated. And probably no parliamentary government was going to survive that. And certainly, if the Lincoln administration somehow rode out the defeat of the Battle of Bull Run, it would have been gone in a year's time in July 1862, uh, when the great army, the greatest army ever organized on the North American uh, continent, uh, the uh, George McClellan's Army of the Potomac uh, and the Peninsula Campaign got close enough to Richmond, you know, to hear the church bells from their lines, but then couldn't take it and fell back in defeat. And at that point, for sure, the Lincoln administration would have fallen after a 17-month term. But it's the United States Constitution that uh, prevented that from uh, happening um, because we don't have a parliamentary government. And the Constitution shaped the war in just astonishing ways. I, I think, for example, um, military historians or armchair military historians have wondered for generations uh, why it was that the Confederacy threw away its single greatest military advantage, which was being on the defensive. Uh, well, uh, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, he knew the Constitution of the United States just as well as Abraham Lincoln did. He knew that a determined anti-slavery Republican would uh, be commander-in-chief until March of 1865. Jefferson Davis couldn't turn around and sort of say to the, to the people in the Confederacy, well, look, just hunker down, um, 
uh, the, the, there'll be a lot of bombardment and invasion. Uh, but if we just hold on for four years until March of 1865, maybe another administration will come in and we can negotiate with them and get a peace. You can't do that in any kind of government based on public opinion. And Jefferson Davis uh, knew he couldn't do that and he didn't do it. So instead, you know, he had to do something. And what he did was uh, invade the North with the disastrous consequences of the defeat at Antietam in Maryland in 1862 and the defeat at Gettysburg in Pennsylvania in 1863. So to me, the real hero of the Civil War is the Constitution. And that would be the first point I'd always want to make about it. But still, it's not a hero in all respects. Uh, certainly, it was not the hero of emancipation. It was a big problem for emancipation. And uh, likewise, uh, there are great questions about civil liberties during the Civil War. But for the military outcome of the war, uh, I think it was almost decisive. Well, I'm here today to talk about civil liberties in the Civil War, mainly. And so I thought what would be best to do is just to move immediately to perhaps the most controversial arrest by, of a civilian by military authorities in the North during the Civil War. This is in um, May of 1863. And after that arrest, then the letter that Abraham Lincoln wrote to explain it, the public letter, uh, the Corning letter. Now that's in your handout. Uh, long excerpts uh, from the Corning letter are in there. Uh, it's called Lincoln's Response, I think. And I'll give you some background on this uh, letter. Uh, it, it's called the Corning letter because uh, Lincoln answer, was answering a protest of Clement Vallandigham's arrest. There were all kinds of protests all across the North because of this uh, arrest of this Ohio a politician named Clement Blandingham in May of 1863. And the protest meeting in Albany, New York, sent a letter to the president. And the first person to sign a lot of people signed it, but the first person to sign it was Erastus Corning. So Lincoln's answer to the letter is called the Corning letter. All right. And the events that led up to uh, Lincoln's defense of his internal security policy during the Civil War were these. In April of 1863, General Ambrose Burnside um, had wisely uh, been uh, more or less exiled from actually fighting the Confederate armies after his disastrous defeat, disastrous defeat at the Battle of uh, Fredericksburg in December 1862. And so they reassigned Burnside to what was called the Department of the Ohio. This was not a wise choice. Um, he had his headquarters in Cincinnati, and he had control of all the military affairs in what we would call the states of the old Northwest. As it turned out, General Burnside's uh, approach to the home front was exactly like his approach to the Confederate Army, frontal assault. All right. So as soon as he got in Cincinnati, he issued in April what was called General Orders Number 38. And it stated, among other things, that, I think this quote is in your handout, that the habit of declaring sympathies with the enemy will no longer be tolerated in this department. Quote. Well, Clement Vallandigham, this Democratic politician from Ohio, he was out of a job. He'd been gerrymandered out of his seat. And he took a look at this and he said, oh boy. Uh, he would, he thought, go out and give a speech criticizing the administration. Uh, Burnside, whom Flanningham considered a blockhead, uh, would uh, say that this speech was, quote, declaring sympathies with the enemy. Uh, have Vlandingham arrested. He would become a political martyr to liberty. The Democrats in Ohio would nominate him for governor, and he would win in 1863. It almost worked. Uh, Vlandingham gave the speech in Mount Vernon, Ohio in May 1863. Uh, the, uh, Burnside had in the audience his spies who were taking notes on the speech. Uh, 
They reported it to the general. Uh, he had Vlandingham arrested. He was tried by a military commission, we all know what those are, uh, and convicted, and then <clears throat> banished to the Confederacy. Well, the Confederates had no more use for Vlandingham than the Union did. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, eventually he departed the Confederacy, he ran the blockade, he went to Canada and eventually uh, to Windsor, and from there, meanwhile, the Democrats in Ohio nominated him for governor, as he had planned, and he ran his campaign in exile from Canada. <laughs> well, he, he lost in the fall, but they didn't know that was going to happen in the summer. And so uh, this had caused the protests and caused the letter from Erastus Corning and then uh, Lincoln's answer to it, the Corning letter. Now in this letter, as I say, there are long excerpts from it in your uh, handout there, uh, Lincoln did four things. And in general, one of them we've noticed and the other three, which are equally important, have sort of escaped uh, our notice. And the first thing that Lincoln did that we're bound to recognize is he offered a sound bite, all right? Uh, and it's quoted in the handout, and Lincoln said, it's often been, it was often quoted at the time, it's often been quoted since. Lincoln said, must I shoot the simple-minded soldier boy who deserts and not touch a hair on the head of the wily agitator who induces him to desert? Right? So that's a sound bite uh, and uh, memorable. The other things he said, though, you wouldn't want to forget. One of the things he did was to describe the Civil War secession uh, the, as a conspiracy, a 30-year conspiracy. Um, and uh, in other words, saying that the Confederacy had three decades of preparation. And so that in his mind, the war began, uh, as he said, on very unequal terms. In other words, the Confederacy had all, all the advantages because they'd been in conspiring for a generation uh, to secede and cause the Civil War. So he created a conspiracy theory. Then Lincoln said that part of that long preparation uh, that the South had uh, done included the hope, and I quote, to keep on foot amongst us a most efficient core of spies, informers, suppliers, and aiders and abettors of their cause. Unquote. So in other words, they left planted in the north uh, um, spies and saboteurs. And these people, he said, would operate, quote, under cover of liberty of speech, liberty of the press, and habeas corpus. Unquote. So in other words, the protests of the president's policy in the name of freedom of speech, they were, and this is a quote from the letter, part of the enemy's program. So if you protested in the name of the First Amendment, you were part of the enemy's program. Right. Then, the next thing he did, which I think is even more astonishing, uh, Lincoln criminalized silence. Uh, he said that silence was not good enough as a proof of loyalty, <clears throat> and quote, the man, <clears throat> excuse me, the man who stands by and says nothing when the peril of his government is discussed cannot be misunderstood. If not hindered, he is sure to help the enemy. So Lincoln demanded a kind of noisy uh, patriotism. Uh, silence wouldn't do. And added, much more if he talks ambiguously, talks for his country with buts and ifs and ands. Well, think about that. Who talks about his country with buts and ifs and ands? The loyal opposition does. The other party does. In the Civil War, the Democratic Party did. So in other words, the Democratic Party said, uh, oh yeah, we support the administration unless, but not, but not if uh, they change the purpose of the war from saving the Union to what the Democrats regarded as a fanatical abolitionist uh, program. Uh, the Democrats uh, said they would continue to support the administration in the war effort if the administration adhered to the Constitution. 
So it's the opposition that speaks with buts and ifs and ands. So in other words, uh, Lincoln has uh, criminalized silence and furthermore uh, threatened the very existence of an opposition political party. Well, these are all um, words, uh, part of the enemy's program, and pretty uh, strong words. Uh, and I think that if uh, you read the Corning letter with historical imagination, if you look at those uh, excerpts that are in your handout, that it's the kind of letter that ought to make the little hairs stand up on the back of your neck. It is the scariest letter on civil liberties ever written by an American president, period. Um, and you can draw a straight line uh, from that letter to, let's say, to uh, President uh, Bush's Attorney General, John Ashcroft. On December 6, 2001, this is less than two, two months after the 9-11 attack, um, Attorney General Ashcroft, in a statement to the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, said, quote, To those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty, my message is this. Your tactics only aid terrorists, for they erode our national unity and diminish our resolve. They give ammunition to America's enemies, unquote. Is that shocking? Well, not if you read the Corning letter. So, as I said, though, these are words, not deeds. And so one thing we, we want to do is to uh, measure internal security, measure, uh, the internal security programs of uh, presidential administrations by behavior, not by what they say. I learned my political science actually from Richard Nixon's attorney general, John Mitchell, who at one point said, uh, watch what we do, not what we say. So I'm always careful to do that. I watch what they do and not what they say. But even if we look at what the Lincoln administration did, uh, we can still draw parallels uh, to the present, even in the case of the most controversial sort of behavior, torture. Were there foreshadowings of uh, waterboarding in the Lincoln administration? The answer is yes. Um, among um, the arrests of civilians made by military authorities in the North were people who were suspected of desertion. And some of them turned out actually not to be deserters. Uh, but they had to interrogate them in prison to find out whether they were deserters or not. And one of the standard practices was to subject uh, the suspected deserters to uh, something that was a good deal short of waterboarding, but it did involve water. It had very painful consequences, and it was papered over by the administration with euphemisms. Uh, these things were called shower baths uh, by the military authorities who administered them. And the practice would never have been discovered at all uh, had it not been the case that some of the civilians arrested to whom who were subjected to this uh, torture, uh, were some of them were British subjects. And this resembles a little bit uh, the early situation with the Guantanamo uh, detainees. At, at first, there was more interest in the ones who were British citizens than the ones who uh, weren't. Uh, and the same was true in the Civil War. Uh, the British government took a very dim view of another government abusing its uh, citizens, and they watched out for it. Uh, many of the British subjects in the Civil War military prisons were recent immigrants to the United States, especially from uh, Ireland. Uh, the British officials listened if these prisoners complained. They, in fact, even toured the northern uh, military prisons to see if there were British subjects in there who were being abused. And so when a British official uh, encountered uh, one of these uh, prisoners who complained, well, then they would demand an explanation from the State Department. The State Department was compelled to answer. Uh, they couldn't just stonewall because of the 
diplomatic situation of the United States in the Civil War. The principal job of the United States uh, Secretary of State during the Civil War was to keep Great Britain out of the war, to keep them from intervening and helping the Confederacy so it would restore the, the flow of cotton to the cotton mills in Lancashire. And so when the British representative complained, uh, William H. Seward had to um, answer. Uh, and so that's how we know about it. Well, let me give you some examples of this. One of the British prisoners was a man named Matthew Murphy. Uh, he was an Irish American uh, who was put in jail in Alexandria, Virginia in October 1864. And he'd been arrested, as many of these men had, on suspicion of desertion because he was wearing some government issue clothing. Uh, and uh, because, in his case, he was a hard looking man, the authorities said. <laughs> and once Murphy was in prison, he complained that he had been handcuffed and suspended from the ceiling by his wrists. Uh, federal authorities in Alexandria could not categorically deny. That, uh, that they couldn't say for sure that they hadn't treated him that way. Well, another British subject, J.W. Nash, represented what I think is a more typical case. Like many of these suspects who uh, were arrested on suspicion of desertion, he was picked up in a railroad station. The government had agents who hung around the railroad stations looking for people boarding trains who looked like deserters. One of the signs was to be wearing some kind of government issue uh, uniform part, uh, as J.W. Nash was. Furthermore, he was with two men who turned out to be uh, deserters, uh, and he was carrying a substantial amount of money, the same amount of money each of the other fellows with him was carrying. So he was suspected of being what in the Civil War they called a bounty jumper. Uh, late in the war, the governments offered very large uh, bounties for volunteering, and there were people who took the bounties, uh, enlisted, and then just took the money and deserted. Right? And so uh, there's much suspicion and hatred of these uh, bounty jumpers. Uh, he was suspected of it, put in prison, and the British minister to the United States, Lord Lyons, heard about it, and when he did, he learned that, uh, that um, Nash had been the victim of, quote, violent cold water shower baths, unquote. Um, the central guardhouse where Nash was being held, the head of it explained the punishment this way. He had been subjected to what is called a shower bath, which consists of a stream of water from a small rubber hose. It is not severe, nor at this season of the year very unpleasant as the prisoners there shower each other for their own comfort daily. Right. <laughs> the captain's description um, did not sound very convincing to Lord Lyons, uh, and he told the Secretary of State, this explanation does not show that the cold water was applied in Nash's case in conformity with any law or regulations as a punishment for a known and proved offense. On the contrary, it tends to confirm the statement that it is used in the central guardhouse for the purpose of extorting by the infliction of bodily pain confessions from persons suspected of being deserters. Well, later that same summer, uh, the British protested the treatment of another prisoner who had been subjected to a, quote, a hose of water directed with full and powerful action against his naked person, and that inquiry led to an admission by the highest ranking lawyer in the army, the judge advocate general, uh, that this treatment had been prescribed for certain kinds of prisoners, uh, but it was still called a shower bath. Uh, one uh, of the uh, prisoners uh, writing in, to the British representative to protect him, uh, his name was James Buckley, uh, said that uh, he had been subjected to showering for two hours until his skin broke. Well, how far up the administration did knowledge of this practice go? Well, we know it went at least as high as the Secretary of State, William H. Seward. He was forced to 
uh, answer the British protests, uh, and he did so dutifully. Uh, he uh, asked the prison authorities what they were doing. He forwarded to the British representative their answers, but he didn't, uh, as far as I know, he didn't participate in any kind of cover-up. He answered the British questions, but on the other hand, he didn't apparently forward reports of this uh, to the Secretary of War or to the President of the United States. Um, he didn't protest in behalf of the, the British civilians who were held and tortured. He didn't denounce the torture. He didn't attempt to end it. He just answered the British representative. Well, I think there's one other thing we need as a sort of preliminary to uh, measuring and evaluating the civil liberties in the North uh, during the Civil War, uh, and that is to, I think, um, dismiss some of the myths that surround the writ of habeas corpus, described in your handout there, and a very good definition of it, but also described as the great writ of uh, liberty. And, and of course, these contests between the president and the courts when they issue a writ of habeas corpus and order from a judge to uh, uh, the authorities holding someone who's been arrested to produce that body in his court and explain under what charges and uh, suspicions he's been arrested. And if the judge thinks they are inadequate or unlawful, he will dismiss the prisoner. That's what a writ of habeas corpus does. And so we tend to think, I think, that the, uh, in a contest between the judiciary and the president, that it's basically between the executive branch and the judiciary, that it's basically an unequal contest. The executive has all the power and the judiciary doesn't have much. Uh, but this simply isn't true in the Civil War. Uh, the Supreme Court at the time was undergoing a revival, uh, in fact, maybe the establishment of the first great period of judicial activism. Uh, and it went from the Supreme Court to all the other courts, uh, federal and state in the land. And of course, the great symbol of this rise of judicial activism in the Supreme Court was the Dred Scott decision of 1857. And in the bookstore uh, here at the Historical Society, uh, I noticed they have a copy of Don Fehrenbacher's great book on the Dred Scott case. I recommend it uh, as, uh, as I think it's the best book ever written on a single case, uh, a single Supreme Court case in American history. And what jo Don Fehrenbacher uh, says in there that essentially the Tawney Court, Roger B. Tawney wrote the opinion, he was the Chief Justice and he would be the Chief Justice during the Civil War as well until 1864 that essentially the Supreme Court hijacked the Constitution for the sake of slavery, uh, for racism, and for the Southern slaveholders' agenda. The surge in judicial uh, activism uh, spread to the other judges, uh, federal and state in the country. Now, you won't notice this uh, surge in judicial activism in the Civil War itself, even though Roger B. Tawney remains the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And there are really two reasons for that. Uh, the first one is simply how long it took for a case to get to the Supreme Court on appeal. And the best example of that is the Dred Scott case itself. From the time when Dred Scott filed his um, f first appeal, to the, uh, his first case in the court in St. Louis in 1846 until the time that Roger B. Tawney uh, read his opinion out loud in 1857 in Washington. That's 11 long years from the beginning of it to the end. Well, 11 years is almost the time for three civil wars to begin and end. And so the biggest protection from judicial act from judicial activism on the part of the Supreme Court during the Civil War was uh, simply uh, this long lag between initiation and uh, actually reaching an opinion of the court. But I don't want you to think that the substantial silence of the United States Supreme Court uh, during the Civil War stemmed from judicial restraint. It did not. Uh, the 
uh, Roger B. Taney uh, and other justices were simply dying to attack the administration's war effort. In fact, Taney had his uh, biographer, Carl Brent, Brent Swisher, discovered this, I think. Uh, Taney had sitting in his desk, ready to go as soon as the proper kind of case came before him, an eight-page opinion declaring the Legal Tender Act unconstitutional. That was basically the way the war was funded. And he had, sitting in his desk, ready to go, a 22-page opinion already written out saying that conscription was unconstitutional. In other words, the principal law that helped mobilize uh, the manpower in the North for the war. Tony's mind was made up. He just needed a case to get before him in the court. <laughs> they have only appellate jurisdiction in most kinds of cases. And think about this. This is the way the war was funded. Uh, this is the way uh, the manpower was mobilized. So this would be just attacking the war uh, itself and declaring it as uh, unconstitutional. Well, I said, incidentally, that, that Tawney was uh, dying uh, to attack the war effort. And that, incidentally, was a, uh, an appropriate choice of words. And that's the other reason that the US Supreme Court didn't interfere more than it did. Uh, Tawney was 87 years old. Uh, he'd been appointed a whole generation ago by President Andrew Jackson. Uh, and he was uh, ill uh, for much of the time and couldn't attend court and then finally died in 1864. I'll have to say much to the relief of the Republicans. Uh, back when James Buchanan had been president bef before Lincoln's uh, election, the Democrat uh, Buchanan, the Republicans were afraid that Tawney might die then and that the Democratic president then would get to choose the next chief justice. And it didn't happen. Tawney lived on. So when the Republicans gained the presidency in 1860, well, it looked different. And the Republican senator from Ohio, uh, Benjamin Wade, uh, wrote in 1863, while Tawney was still alive, quote, I prayed with earnestness for the life of Tawney to be prolonged through Buchanan's administration. And by God, I'm a little afraid I've overdone the matter. <laughs> so. Well. The fact of the matter is that the United States courts were then, I think they probably still are today, uh, the most powerful judiciary in the world. And during the Civil War, they could literally stop an army on the march by issuing a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, now, let me explain uh, what I mean by that uh, with an example. Uh, the writ of habeas corpus uh, had many uses in the 19th century and not the ones necessarily that come first to mind today. If somebody wrongfully arrested, the judge checks upon it uh, and lets him go. Uh, well, during the Civil War, for example, uh, the Army had many underage soldiers in it. You couldn't enlist without your parents' consent until you were 18 years old. But a lot of soldiers younger than that did enlist, volunteered, and they did it, you know, their brother had joined up, uh, and it seemed like a glorious and exciting thing to do. Or they had an abusive father on the farm that couldn't wait to get away from him. Whatever the cause, there were many people who were under 18 who enlisted, who lied about their age, and who were accepted in the Army because, well, it was very difficult to prove age. There's no birth certificate. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, age was, uh, if you challenged the age, it could only be uh, proven by entries in the family Bible, say, uh, or by testimony from grandparents. And family Bible entries can be forged. Uh, grandparents might lie. Uh, and so it was very hard for the army to uh, uh, prove the age of a soldier. So some youth uh, imitating uh, his brother would enlist, underage, get in the army and find out it wasn't quite as glorious as it had seemed when his brother joined. Uh, he could get a lawyer. A lawyer could go to a judge and ask for a writ of habeas corpus. The judge would demand that the commander bring the soldier into his court and explain uh, uh, whether he was under age or not, as though the army were in jail. And the soldier had volunteered to, you know, hadn't volunteered to be in it. Uh, it it's, it's not quite uh, what it 
uh, themes when we think of the habeas corpus in uh, its, its common uses. Um, so the army fought these cases uh, hard as they could. Um, their view was that once you were in the army, there were only two ways out, and that was in a coffin or when the war was over. Uh, and the idea that the soldiers could sit around scheming to game the legal system somehow and get out, they thought that was entirely destructive of military discipline uh, and dangerous to the uh, organization of the army. The Lincoln administration did as well, and they had a great deal of trouble with this because this powerful judiciary, uh, this powerful judiciary was on the whole politically hostile to the administration. The, the country's politics had been di um, dominated by Democrats for the whole generation before the Civil War. And so judges with life tenure or with very long tenure uh, were, the judiciary was just stacked with Democrats who would um, uh, rule in habeas corpus cases to allow soldiers to escape the army. In fact, one of Lincoln's proclamations suspending the writ of habeas corpus is specifically for these kinds of cases. So, uh, it's important to realize then, remember, that the contest between the executive and the judiciary isn't as unequal as you might think. And furthermore, it's important to remember that cases involving the writ of habeas corpus don't necessarily have to do with uh, political dissent or political criticism of the war. All right. Okay. Uh, well, it's still the record of the Lincoln administration uh, it, it leaves us with uh, questions of uh, civil liberties. Uh, more than 15,000 arrests of civilians in the North by military authority during the Civil War. And in order to judge the administration, we need you know, comparisons and some kind of system. So uh, I've been writing about civil liberties uh, under the Lincoln administration for about 25 years. Uh, and so I've come up with a system uh, for ranking presidents' policies on the civil liberty, for ranking their internal security uh, measures. And in this way, we can kind of get a comparative grip on the question, I think. And so today, uh, I want to deal with, let's see, there are four presidents, four other presidents illustrated in there, uh, John Adams and Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and George W. Bush, I'm going to deal with the first three. <laughs> um, I write only about dead people. <laughs> and right. So, I do have the system, and I must confess, you know, I'm a college professor and I just can't help it. Uh, along with this system, I, I have a grading system, all right? And so it goes from F to A. So we're going to give grades to the presidents on their internal security system. And I think there are three ways of testing them that are essential. Three questions you have to ask of an internal security system imposed by an American president. And the first one is, does the system, is it proportionate to the threat? All right? Uh, or is it out of all proportion to the threat? We've seen that the language uh, that presidents use is often way out of proportion to the threat, right? But I'm talking about actual behavior, all right? Who gets arrested? How many? For what reasons? Right. Uh, the second question uh, is this. Is the internal security system used for other purposes than meeting the original threat? That's a very important question. Uh, and there are lots of considerations under it. We have to pay uh, particular attention uh, to the use of an internal security system to prey on vulnerable portions of the society uh, and you know, people who are identified for arrest, for example, by their ethnicity. The law professor Jeffrey Stone, who wrote a very good book on this called Law and Liberty, says that, quote, almost always the individuals whose rights are sacrificed are not those who make the laws, but minorities, dissenters, and non-citizens. In those circumstances, we are making a decision to sacrifice 
their rights. Uh, so in that case, uh, following what Stone says, we have to uh, ask that question. Are there sort of, is there collateral damage or is this used for uh, other ends? And the crucial part of this test it, for the 19th century was, is the system being used to eliminate the opposition party? That's the big question they asked then. And the third thing we have to consider uh, is this. Once the initial threat ends, does the internal security system also end? Uh, Jeffrey Stone uh, calls this a, the, a sunset provision. So if we look, for example, at the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, over which John Adams, President John Adams, uh, what he administered, uh, well, they had what Stone calls a sunset provision. That is, uh, they would no longer be in effect, the sedition part of the Alien and Sedition Acts would no longer be in effect when the next president came to office. So that was about a two-year uh, period. And when I read that in Stone's book, I hadn't thought about it, but I went back and looked at Lincoln's proclamation suspending the writ of habeas corpus, and I noticed that they applied during the existing insurrection. Those are the words in them. And alas, though, you know, we don't really know for sure whether Lincoln would have relaxed it uh, when the threat was over because he died uh, before the Civil War was completely ended. Now, as for the grading system, I allow a full range of grades from F to A, all right? I, I, that's what I give at Penn State, F to A. Uh, and uh, the, well, the F grade, what's that? I reserve that for anyone whose uh, internal security system kept on being used after the threat until, until he became a dictator. All right, so if you became a dictator, you get an F. Well, obviously, you know enough American history to know that that didn't happen. And so I'm not going to give any Fs today. But otherwise, we have the full range of grades. All right, so let's begin with the first person in your handout, John Adams. I give him a D. And that's because of the Aliens and Sedition Acts of 1798. The main thing there is to remember that he fails the provocations test. There wasn't even a war. There was when the Alien and Sedition Acts were put in place, only a quasi-war with France. This was fought on the seas only. Uh, as Jeffrey Stone points out, uh, some 316 American ships were seized by the French, but it was all at sea. So the arrest of Baltimore newspaper editors and the other sorts of people who got arrested under the Sedition Act, that doesn't really have anything to do uh, with ships uh, on the uh, seas. So. Adam's system was principally had other uses. And here are the facts and figures. We have to look at behavior, remember, not just what they say. Under the Sedition Act, 25 people were arrested, 14 indicted, and 10 were tried and convicted. So you say, well, gosh, that's not very many. All right, well, the trick is that almost all of them were Jeffersonian Republicans, and they were newspaper editors, printers, and public writers. If you look at what the media historian Michael Shudson says about this uh, period, there were only about 200 newspapers in the whole country uh, at the time. And of those, maybe 50 were Republican newspapers. So that means that the Adams administration took legal action against as much as half of the Republican press. And that a quarter to a third of all the Republican editors were indicted. Now, this is a full-scale assault on the opposition party, not on the French Navy. All right. And since a newspaper was the one essential thing uh, that any political party had to have to exist, uh, this was a very serious threat to having a political opposition. Uh, the Adams administration also I think flunks the victim's test in the sense that the alien part of the Alien and Sedition Acts was aimed at uh, vulnerable immigrants uh, principally. So the Adams administration, as it turns out, passes only the sunset test as, uh, by uh, Stone's definition, and otherwise it fails. How do we account for this? I think the answer is that it was, after all, an 18th century uh, presidential administration. 
uh, and it uh, functioned in an era when there was no belief that there could be a loyal opposition, when there was a belief that political parties were essentially seditious. And uh, so uh, that, I think, helps explain the bad record of the Adams administration. Well, let's move up into a very different period and look at Woodrow Wilson. I give him a C minus. Um, he rates above I Adams. Uh, I'm a notoriously tough grader, okay? So <laughs> he rates uh, that grade because uh, Wilson, he gets a higher grade than Adams uh, because uh, Wilson uh, certainly didn't altogether fail the provocations test. He has a real war and a big war, uh, World War I, but it was a foreign war, which offered very little threat to what we have come to call the homeland. Uh, the internal security system under the Wilson administration was aimed, at least in part, at sedition and uh, espionage. It was much more extensive uh, in its effects than the Adams administration program. Congress passed uh, espionage acts in 1917 and 1918. And under those, and here are the facts and figures on behavior, they're critical, the administration conducted 2,168 trials and brought 1,055 convictions. Now, one of these, um, just yesterday I, I visited the courtroom in uh, which uh, Rose Pastor Stokes in St. Paul, in the, what's now the landmark building, uh, was uh, convicted under the espionage Act uh, for, I think, writing a letter to the editor of the Minneapolis Star. Uh, and uh, her, it was serious. She was given a 10 year sentence. The, um, the case was, the decision was later overturned. Uh, but that gives you some idea of even the local impact uh, of these measures. Um, besides, these, it's clear that the Wilson administration used its internal security system uh, to attack um, groups that it didn't like for other reasons. 150 leaders of the industrial workers of the world were arrested under the system. Uh, the administration also failed the victim's test uh, because it arrested 6,300 enemy aliens uh, and <clears throat> incarcerated them in the principal way uh, in which they threatened liberty uh, was to allow the quasi-governmental vigilante American Protective League to conduct what were called slacker raids. These resulted in the arrest of some 40,000 individuals. And these were essentially the American Protective League would sweep down on the cheap hotels in a city and just arrest any young man in there that was of uh, draft age. And that resulted in uh, uh, 40,000 arrests. And uh, some of these were, uh, as I say, many of these were clearly aimed, had other purposes uh, besides internal security. Um, they were aimed at an opposition party, namely the American Socialist Party. The historian uh, James Green argues in Grassroots Socialism, quote, Wartime repression and patriotic coercion killed the Socialist Party in the Southwest. Um, it's also true, I think, that the Wilson administration doesn't really entirely pass the sunset test because the atmosphere of repression and, uh, and continuing uh, arrest by uh, the Attorney General uh, were parts of the uh, anti-radical program after the war was over, the so-called Red Scare. So the, the, the system doesn't really end altogether. Okay, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, I give him a D. His saving grace, of course, came on the question of provocation. Uh, world War II, of course, included a Japanese attack on United States territory. And if you've read uh, John Lewis Gaddis's very good book on this uh, called Surprise, Security, and the American Experience, and he points out 
that attack on the United States has been very rare, and surprise attacks on the United States even rarer. There was really only the British burning of the White House in 1814 in the War of 1812, uh, and Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, and then finally 9-11. And so one of these challenges Franklin Delano Roosevelt had to face. But the people actually targeted uh, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's internal security system, Japanese Americans, offered no real provocation themselves. I don't think there was a single act of sabotage or fifth column activity by any Japanese American in all of World War II. The, uh, the provocation, moreover, had pretty clearly been removed even before Roosevelt imposed the system, at least the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, claimed it had, and he said that he had already arrested all the people who were suspected of uh, spying uh, for Japan. He opposed the Roosevelt system. He said it was useless. He'd already done the job. <laughs> so the Roosevelt administration pretty spectacularly fails the victim's test because the identification of the enemy in this instance was entirely by, by skin color, uh, not by their likelihood to threaten national security. It's notorious, of course, that the Roosevelt administration did not put German Americans in concentration camps. It didn't put Italian Americans in concentration camps, as it did Japanese Americans. Now, I will say uh, Roosevelt passes the Jeffrey Stone Sunset Test uh, because he ordered an end to this system before the w war was over. But I would say we could balance that on the other side by pointing out that the system had been planned before any provocation, uh, well before the attack on Pearl Harbor. It had been planned by the Navy Department in 1936, five years before uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. They planned concentration camps for Japanese Americans then. Uh, the plan, of course, as it turns out, was carried out. 120,000 persons uh, arrested and put in, uh, they were called relocation centers uh, during the war. They changed the name. Okay, uh, what do we do about Abraham Lincoln? Uh, I think that these examples I've given provide pretty much a contrast with the measures of the Lincoln administration. President Lincoln admitted even when he was defending his system, even when he was defending it in a letter as scorching as that Corning letter, uh, he admitted uh, that mistakes could be made, that as he put it, quote, instances of arresting innocent persons might occur as are always likely to occur in such cases and then a clamor will be raised, he said, in quote. Uh, and so Lincoln may have presided over a mistake-prone system, but uh, Roosevelt's uh, system was all just a big mistake. <laughs> it's a very different thing. Uh, well, if we're thinking about, though, what grade to assign Abraham Lincoln, I'll tell you the history of grades that have been assigned to him. You may be surprised at this. He's often been given an F, uh, and uh, that... Uh, in other words, he was called a dictator uh, for his actions on civil liberties during the Civil War. Um, for example, by the great literary critic Edmund Wilson. Uh, he compared, in a famous New Yorker article, he compared Lincoln to Bismarck and Lenin and said they were all dictators. Uh, the people who founded political science in America about a century ago, uh, many of them thought that Lincoln was a dictator, including, for example, the the two political scientists at Columbia University, uh, William A. Dunning and John W. Burgess, they thought that Lincoln had dictatorial powers. Uh, I think that in modern times, uh, in political science and elsewhere, uh, this has pretty well subsided. Uh, not many people uh, uh, do it. And most modern historians give Lincoln at least passing uh, marks. And it's because of one simple observation which was made by the historian Harold Hyman in 1977. And he 
um, pointed out, after what I think is, you know, 70 years of pretty muddled thinking on this subject, he sort of cleared the air, uh, and he said, quote, the most remarkable thing about the presidential election of 1864 is that it occurred. <laughs> In other words, that's how you get dictators. You say, oh, we have too big a national emergency to have all this divisiveness uh, and criticism in the midst of a war effort. We've got to postpone the election, and then you keep postponing, and then postpone. that's how you get dictators. Uh, Lincoln uh, had nothing to do with uh, such a scheme. So he clearly wasn't a dictator. Uh, he clearly doesn't get an F, but that leads to the whole scale uh, 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 above F. Uh, I think, uh, of course, that we can't, absolutely evaluate Lincoln on the Jeffrey Stone sunset uh, test because he was murdered before the provocation entirely ended. If you pay close attention state by state to the operation of the policies, and particularly, uh, in particular if you look at Missouri, which uh, had the biggest uh, problems in the North during the Civil War, it's pretty clear that near the end of the administration, Lincoln was relaxing martial law. Uh, and so there are some clues what direction he was going, but we don't know for sure. Uh, and as for collateral damage, uh, I think, you know, uh, who were the victims? I think uh, uh, Lincoln has a pretty good uh, record uh, on that. Uh, but still in all, we are faced with that figure, 15,000, probably a lot more than that, uh, civilians arrested by military authority during the Civil War with very limited sabotage and fifth column activity in the North during the Civil War. And so I think that actually what I'm going to do is end with a question and not an answer. What grade would you give Lincoln? Take questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to go back to the Corning letter. And what surprises me is that Lincoln felt it necessary to make such a multi pronged defense of what he had done, given that, it seems to me anyway, that Article I of the Constitution pretty clearly states that in the case of uh, a rebellion or invasion, uh, the president uh, can uh, suspend the... Okay, the very good courts. question. And it's really two questions in one. Uh, that is, well, couldn't he suspend the writ of habeas corpus anyway? And so why does he need such a, a vigorous and scary defense, right? Well, in fact, actually, uh, what the Constitution says in Article 1, Section 9 is that the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended except in cases of rebellion or invasion when the public safety demands it. Uh, it doesn't say who. And it's in Article I, which is the article of the Constitution dealing with Congress. So most authorities, most people in the Supreme Court, most people who had written about the American Constitution, they just assumed it was a congressional power. And so what was controversial about what Lincoln did is that the president suspended it, all right, in terms of the, the, the unconstitutionality of it. And, and uh, Roger B. Tony challenged that immediately in a case called Ex parte Merriman and said the president didn't have the power. Now, then, how do you account for this hair-raising defense that Lincoln gives in June of 1863. And I think it is essential uh, to understand, uh, you know, he learned about the arrest of Lanningham from the newspapers. He took a very bad case here. Uh, but he was a good lawyer and could defend even a bad client. But why does he sound like that? And there, the, the explanation, this is the historian's exp explanation for everything, right, is context. Uh, this is what a historian does, uh, a, a, a historian of the Constitution does, that maybe a constitutional lawyer doesn't do. Uh, whenever you look at a statement from the Lincoln administration during the Civil War, one thing you always want to say is, where was Robert E. Lee's army? Where was Robert E. Lee's army when the Corning Letter, which was uh, issued by the President on June 12th, 1863, where was Robert E. Lee's army? He was on the brink of invading the North after the uh, victory 
at the Battle of Chancellorsville, the campaign, of course, that would end in Gettysburg. So in other words, this is what a president says when the enemy is at the gates. That's, it's essential in all statements on constitutional questions to contextualize them, and it's very important in the case of the Corning letter to do that. <laughs> it degraded. Yeah. I have an easy question for you. Um, could you give us the, uh, on the, on the uh, Tawny uh, quotation uh, in reference to Dred Scott, could you give us the name of the uh, book and the author again, please? Oh, sure. I'm, I'm glad to do that because it's a great book. Uh, the author is Don E. Fehrenbacher, F-E-H-R-E-N-B-A-C-H-E-R. As I say, there's a copy of this book uh, in the bookstore here. Uh, he wrote a big kind of doorstop-sized book on the Dred Scott case, and it's called, uh, um, uh, well, the, the title, there's a subtitle, but the title is just the Dred Scott case. But then, happily for us, he also later abridged it uh, in, a, <laughs> yeah, in, a, in a shorter uh, uh, version. So you can have the long version or the kind of Reader's Digest the condensed version, but they're both uh, very good. It's the definitive book on the Dred Scott case. And uh, a model of a clear writing. I don't know if you've read much Supreme Court history. It is not generally marked by clear writing. Uh, and uh, uh, in that regard, it's, uh, that's another regard in which it's a very great book and has very incisive judgments on the nature of the court and the nature of the decision itself. And uh, a very striking portrait of Roger B. Taney in the bargain. Um, oh, can you? Okay, Can you comment on uh, Lincoln as a lawyer uh, contributing to his exercise of the Constitution during the war? Oh, yeah. Or who, we, who our advisors were? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. And uh, it, there is, I think, today um, considerable, uh, there, a lot of people argue that uh, Lincoln was a very successful lawyer, and in Illinois, a lawyer's lawyer. That is, he argued a lot of cases before the Illinois State Supreme Court, that, and that lawyers hired him to, be, uh, to argue cases. Uh, and um, there is a fairly substantial argument to be made that this was preparation uh, for the great constitutional questions that Lincoln faced in the Civil War, and that law practice was a step to statesmanship. And I'll have to say that I simply do not think that's true. And, the, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why. If you look at Lincoln's constitutional ideas, I think he has three essential, uh, uh, con uh, three essential outlooks on the Constitution. One of them is nationalism. And the other one, another one, the second one is broad construction. And the third one is he has essentially an anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution. Now let's go back and think about that. He's a nationalist, right? Well, what made him a nationalist? How early did he become a nationalist? Well, from boyhood. Lincoln is born in 1809. That means he's six years old when the War of 1812 ends, right, in 1815. And one thing that everybody knew in the United States about the War of 1812 is that we damn near lost it. <laughs> and that we better do something quick that you don't have a country, if you do not have roads to march your troops on, if you don't have infrastructure to support them, if you don't have uh, banks uh, that can dispatch their pay, you don't have a country. And so the United States embarked on a crash campaign to make this a country. And that's both in terms of ideas and patriotism, uh, but also in terms of building roads and canals and uh, 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 having protective tariffs so that uh, manufacturing can arise. And Lincoln grows up in this atmosphere that most historians uh, uh, call the era of nationalism in the United States. And so uh, that's just part of his youth that he becomes uh, a nationalist. Well, he, Lincoln also, of course, the other thing that marked him in his youth was that he was a poor boy uh, uh, growing up on sub essentially subsistence farms in Kentucky and then Indiana. Uh, 
Yeah. And uh, he grew up, well, he grew up as an ambitious boy on a lazy frontier. Now, it's hard for us to think. We think of the frontier as being enterprising and all that. The frontier was lazy. Uh, and the reason, well, they had a good reason for it. And that was there was no way to get uh, a surplus to the market, right? So if, all, if you're going to grow a surplus and it just rots in the field, what's the point, right? So if you were forced to be just a subsistence farmer, well, then what the farmers did was uh, opt not to grow a surplus, but, as, uh, but uh, to, uh, they opted for leisure. Uh, and uh, Charles Gershellers, who wrote a, a, a good book about this called uh, The Market Revolution, uh, he points out, you know, that they, they didn't call it leisure. Uh, they called it hunting and fishing. Uh, And I should also say that the, the women didn't opt for leisure. Uh, <laughs> but it was a patriarchal arrangement. Uh, and so Lincoln looks around him, and his, his father looks lazy to him. All his uh, uh, stepbrothers are uh, lazy. Uh, the, all the people seem lazy, but he has this ambition uh, to uh, get ahead. And there was no way to get ahead. He can't get a bank loan. There isn't even a, a, a proper road or railroad to get off the farm. And so in other words, he, he looks around him, and this is existential for him, that the country become economically developed. And the political party that offered the platform of economic development was the Whig Party. And that's why Lincoln's a Whig. It's really existential with him. Uh, it, it, he likes the program of economic development of the Whigs. Now, they wanted national government support to build canals and uh, roads and eventually railroads. And of course, the Constitution doesn't say Congress uh, may build canals and railroads. And so if you go for a government program like this, as Lincoln did, you believe in broad construction. You have to. So that part of his, of his constitutional ideas, uh, that came from uh, really his economic situation as a youth. And then finally, uh, he had the anti-slavery outlook on the Constitution. And this, again, was from very early youth. He said, Lincoln said, that he thought he was naturally anti-slavery, that he could not remember when he did not so think and feel. So in other words, as far back as he could remember, he was anti-slavery. Now, the Constitution, I said the Constitution was a problem for emancipation, uh, and the Constitution was a serious problem for the anti-slavery movement because... Uh, slavery is mentioned three times in the Constitution, not by name, but three times in the three-fifths uh, compromise on uh, representation, and then in the fugitive slave law, and in the provision uh, that said that the international slave trade couldn't be ended uh, for 20 years for any state that wanted to retain it. And so, uh, you know, uh, no cause wants to, in the United States wants to have the Constitution against it. This was a terrible problem for the anti-slavery movement. So what they came up with was an anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution. They said, well, yes, there are these provisions in the, in the Constitution that deal with slavery, but the founders very carefully never used the word slavery. And they used euphemisms for it, like persons held to service or labor. They said that instead of slave. They said what that means is that the founders were ashamed of slavery, uh, that they looked forward to a time in the future uh, when slavery would disappear. Uh, and so the Constitution was essentially a liberal document uh, that looked forward to the end of slavery. That was Lincoln's view of the Constitution as well. Now, you take all three of those views together. They come from very early youth, and he could have had them all without ever setting foot in a courtroom. So the essential ideas don't come from the practice of the law. Uh, he did practice law, and he was a good lawyer, uh, but that's not, I think, where the preparation for statesmanship comes. I respect your, uh, your uh, ability to write only about dead people, but let me phrase the question differently. <laughs> what grade would you give to the 
current Patriot Act and the uh, uses to which it's been put. Um, well, I'll have to say um, uh, thank you for respecting my not wanting to talk about it. <laughs> Uh, and I have to say, I've, I have not read the Patriot Act, and that's sort of, you know, I write on the 19th century, uh, and I have plenty to read there, uh, and so <laughs> what, what I know about, what I know about the modern times is really not expertise, all right? I know what I read in the newspapers, and so my opinion on such matters is really, um, you know, like anybody else's opinion. And that's why, really, I shy away from saying it. If I, if I had the time to deal with it seriously and, and uh, had read the Patriot Act, which I think is pretty long, but uh, if I had read the Patriot Act and uh, had looked at these uh, things past the Roosevelt administration seriously, I wouldn't be afraid to weigh in. But right now, uh, I just really can't do it. You want to know what grade I'd give Lincoln, though? Uh, I, none of you has said. B minus? Oh, yeah. Any others? A, C plus. Yeah, well, these are all, in my grading system, those are all good grades. Uh, uh, but I'm a tough grader. Uh, actually, B minus is closest to the grade I'd give. I give Lincoln a B plus. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly the provocations uh, test he, uh, he meets. Uh, and the victims test, he doesn't have terribly serious problems with. Most of the problems are caused by the fact that it's a 19th century administration. And although he has clear ideas about who ought to be arrested and that the uh, opposition party ought not to be a target of it, he doesn't really control all the people who make the arrests. So there are, you know, it was a, uh, an accident-prone uh, system in this case, and that's problematic. And then, of course, we don't know for sure uh, about whether he'd have ended it when it was over. We just can't know because he was murdered before that happened. Uh, but that, that's all, that, you know, it's just the sort of scale of it that, in my mind, uh, holds him back from uh, getting an A. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. You... You said that the, um, his reasoning came from Article 2, and he opines or he asserts that the um, ability to suspend habeas corpus, Lincoln being he, um, comes from Article 2. But that the, or sorry, Article. Well, that's right. Go ahead. I'll, article yeah. 1. Um, if, who, who, where did he get the idea that okay. that, that was what, where his executive authority yeah. came from, rather than it being a congressional authority yeah. to suspend the writ. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's the, the question is well, if it was clear to everyone else uh, that the that Article One, Section Nine, which is the part of the Constitution that says the writ of habeas corpus can, under certain conditions, be suspended, is the act governing con Congress. Why does Lincoln think the president can do it, and almost no one else did? Certainly, no one else before the Civil War thought it did. Uh, and that's, that's a great question, and we'd have to say first uh, that we don't really know for sure. Uh, but then the circumstances were these. That is, Congress wasn't in session when Fort Sumter is fired on. And so Lincoln calls Congress into session to meet on July 4th, 1861, in an emergency section. But before that, there's still a lot of emergency to deal with. And so in that period... He suspended the writ of habeas corpus. I will say uh, the idea uh, that he was infatuated, I, that's one of the, uh, I didn't, whereas on the one hand I wanted to make clear how important the shaping of the Civil War was, I mean how important the Constitution was in shaping and configuring the Civil War, and you have to look at the Article Two uh, for that, I don't want to leave the impression that Lincoln was infatuated with Article II, and, and was, a, well, basically a hawk on presidential power. Uh, as far as we can tell, he wasn't. I mean, to the degree that he expanded presidential authority, it was for the moment, for the occasion. And I'll tell you a kind of uh, proof of this. Uh, that is, well, when Lincoln had to give his first inaugural address in uh, March, of 1861, uh, one of the things that he needs to do, 
I have sort of, one of the things I didn't say was there was one way in which the Constitution wasn't a big help, and that is secession. Uh, the Constitution doesn't say what Lincoln and most of the other people in the North wished it had said that the Union was perpetual. It doesn't say that. The Articles of Confederation were called the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. The Union is declared to be perpetual three times in the Articles of Confederation, but we chucked them. <laughs> and so Lincoln, when he sits down and has to convince people that secession is not a good idea, he looks in the Constitution, and my God, it's not there. Uh, so he looks back on people who have faced similar crises before, and one of them, of course, is Andrew Jackson. And uh, Jackson had faced a nullification for South Carolina in 1832 and 1833 uh, and had given a very forceful uh, statement against uh, nullification. And Lincoln, in preparing his inaugural address, used that. And he said, well, what did Jackson do? And uh, among other things, uh, 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 Jackson had given a powerful historical argument to say that the Union uh, essentially preceded the Constitution. All right. That was the argument, and Lincoln borrows it. Right. But he doesn't borrow all that Jackson used in the nullification, in the anti-nullification proclamation, because among other uh, things that Jackson argues, you know, Jackson is famous, of course, for expanding presidential power or for discovering presidential power, however you want to say it. But at any rate, he is the source of the powerful presidency in the United States, uh, and. Uh, so when he faces nullification in 1832 and 33, he not only gives this historical argument, but he also says the president is the only office elected by all of the people. So he is then, you know, later people say that Jackson has the idea that he's the tribune of the people, and it's the only uh, office in which all of the people uh, uh, place their will. Well, Lincoln doesn't borrow that. He's not interested in presidential power. He's interested in winning the Civil War. And so the expansions of, of presidential power are uh, purely circumstantial, I would say. I think we'll have our last question. <laughs> but, but, but suspension of the writ of habeas corpus essentially means you don't, you could arrest anybody without actually having a trial. So. Uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts, you actually did have trials, and the Espionage Acts, you did have trials. So it seems to me that the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus is a bit more serious than just actually having criminal statutes about uh, acts, okay? So, mm, do you got a response to that? <laughs> um, well, I would say the Suspending the writ of habeas corpus is very serious business. I didn't mean to imply otherwise. Uh, but I would say that, well, let's look at what the Supreme Court says. All right? Uh, what did the Supreme... After we can see, for example, in the, in the, the Stokes case, that uh, her conviction is overturned, but after the war is over. So after the Civil War is over, the Supreme Court weighs in on the civil liberties question during the Civil War, but it's after the war is over. And so in the famous case, Ex Parte Milligan, the Supreme Court, which is full of Lincoln appointees now, uh, the Supreme Court rules that uh, it is illegal to have trials by a military commission when the civil courts are open, all right? And so uh, trials by military commission, that was probably the most controversial part of the internal security measures of the Lincoln administration as the, is that these people, when they came to trial, uh, if they came to trial, uh, were sometimes tried by military commission. Blandingham was tried by military commission, and that the Supreme Court didn't like. But they never uh, uh, ruled on uh, suspending the writ of habeas corpus in wartime. And most of these, in th the actual fact is that uh, most of the prisoners, I, the, what I did in The Fate of Liberty, that uh, the first book I wrote about this, uh, is, uh, well, at that time, I apologize to all the judges and lawyers who were here, at that time, um, I, I was interested in 
and prisoners who actually got arrested. And judges and lawyers bored me. And so uh, I, didn't really look at, I didn't really look at what they said, uh, but I looked at what they did. And, uh, and so when I studied the uh, arrests, I mean, one of the things you can see is that uh, people were arrested, they were detained for a little while, and then released, and usually didn't get to trial. And, you know, people almost always say, well, in the cases where these people who were somehow, whose liberty was interfered with, if they were newspaper editors or something like that, didn't that have a chilling effect, you know? And uh, the, the astonishing thing is that it did not. Uh, you know, those newspaper editors in the 19th century, they were tough as nails. Uh, and I'm studying it right now. And, I, uh, and, and there, was con there were numerous cases. These weren't really administration measures exactly. There were numerous cases in which the Demo Democratic newspapers in the North, little towns all over, uh, would be shut down, raided by soldiers who were home on leave and would be angry about their policies. And they would... Uh, Trash the presses, trash the office, uh, and, uh, uh, and without any uh, arrest made uh, afterwards by local Republican sheriffs or anything like that. Uh, and uh, it, so if you look at those and then look at what the newspaper does after this threat you know, to their liberty, they're just as critical and bitter uh, as they were to begin with. No more bitter. No less. It seems to have had almost no effect on them. And so what that tells us about journalism and freedom of the press in this period is that is it really wasn't journalism. It was part of party politics. And so, and so the press uh, basically existed for a political party. Uh, and they did the work of political parties, the idea work uh, they did, the propaganda work they did. And so uh, being interfered with temporarily by another administration, um, that was just um, another day in the office. 